Thanks, Jack. And then in uh, 30 seconds, uh, if, uh, if we could get future forecasts for the oil industry. I, I, you know, everybody should, in North Dakota. In North Dakota. Well, everybody should live in exciting times. Uh, it's, it's it would be a real blessing. And I, can, I really feel that we are living in those exciting times in North Dakota. But we hear gloom and doom uh, here and see it in the news uh, daily. Uh, it's not hard to find it. And boy, it's hard to find someone walking around in a cloud in North Dakota. Everybody's saying, hey, this, we're doing good. This is great. You know, everybody's kind of upbeat and uh, ready to go. And I think that, uh, that you know, that's an attitude we have to take. It's, it's one that's, that's going to prevail in North Dakota, in the Wilson Basin, for the next uh, entire generation. So come and join us. We'd like to see you. Thank you. And you can see there's some enthusiasm here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fun to go to work, uh, no matter what's going on, is that, uh, you know, it's, it's the hope and change. Uh, out there that, that <laughs> sorry. I beg your pardon. <laughs> How did that come up? <laughs> so hard. That was that a whole hard. Thing we're doing. Come on out. Uh, 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 do the drive out there. We're going to open up for questions. But do the drives through the bad lines. Some of the most unbelievable scenic uh, byways out there that you will ever see, Lewis and Clark Trail. It's, it's more than just taking a, uh, a drive out there and seeing some uh, woodpeckers going up and down. It's absolutely extraordinary out there, and uh, bring the family when you go out and get a feel of it. So what I'd like to do is take some questions from the audience. Uh, it's not often you get these three gentlemen sitting in one panel. Just raise your hand if you would forget about the food. Yes. Well, I have one that's not directly related to coffee. It's really oil business in general, and I really want to know how to answer critics who say that the oil companies have put billions of dollars in profits and they're just, you know, stealing it off from the economy. Somebody please tell me how to answer that. Strangely enough, I'll be happy to tackle that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you what I say to them, but I wouldn't advise you to do the same. <laughs> uh, the, just to give you some, some framework here, of the top 15 oil companies in the world, just so that you know, strangely enough, number 14 is Exxon. Most people don't know that. The, the ones that are ahead of them are state-owned oil companies that they have to compete with. Every one of those is subsidized, like Saudi Aramco, ENI in Italy, Norse Kidro in uh, Norway, China National Offshore Oil Company, all of those companies compete for projects around the world. So yes, the number is big, but I can tell you that if you were an Exxon shareholder and you were also a Microsoft shareholder or a Coca-Cola shareholder or even a Pepsi-Cola shareholder, you would be very unhappy with your investment in Exxon because the returns are not very good and that company is not growing. The number is big. The number is very big, but it's a very big company. It's kind of like comparing the economy of the United States, uh, while well, we still have one, uh, to the economy of, of Greece. Uh, or let's, well, let me, let me change that. Not the economy of Greece, but compare the United States to the economy of Denmark. Denmark, the numbers are very small. It doesn't look all that exciting or that great, but they have third positive cash territory. They have a very happy electorate. The United States is not in that kind of uh, uh, economic situation, but our numbers are big, and it's the same thing with companies like ExxonMobil or Whiting. We consume ourselves every year. We have to spend money to replace what we produce and more, or the stock market isn't going to give us any money. And it's the same thing with private companies. They have to especially an oil company, you have to find a way to replace everything that you produced and sold and more so that you can continue to live because every year you consume yourself. We have 13 years of reserve production ratio right now. So we have enough, if we stopped drilling, we could produce what we're doing for about 13 years. It's not a very happy circumstance, but you know when you look at reserves, every, every decade, there has been about 10 or 11 years of supply out there. That's been true since the year 1900. And we've continued to grow and grow and grow. That's what technology does. We invest in technology. We have a rock lab in our, in our office. 
and we bought that. Those are $2 million microscopes, $2 million each, that we had to spend. We're not getting anything for that except the ability to better analyze the rock that we drill and core and produce and bring in the office to try to tell if we should spend the money to develop the resource. So it is a very complex business. There are a lot of moving parts. Um, and I would tell you that it's a huge investment. Yes, we're profitable, but we're spending every dime of our cash flow and tapping into our credit line to make those reserve numbers grow. If I could just answer one other thing. The work that we kind of do is sometimes occurs two to five years before any drilling takes place. So in the long term, if White was going to drill in, in uh, Golden Valley County, and they contacted me to put this back together. Which we do. Which you do. I mean, we may have to, uh, it may be years before they can actually get around to it. And so their, their capital investment is laid out a long, long way in advance uh, before any activity. And then building it back to how do they get that energy produced to markets or to refining points, it's investing in the transportation, which is what pipelines provide for them. And that's long-term capital investments that they are ultimately, they're paying the freight to move that energy still own through our pipeline system. Safely and efficiently, less trucks on the road, less issues around flaring and natural gas, things like that. So when people say things to you about oil and gas companies, your your first answer should be, oh yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and alternatively, where else do you want to get that energy? I've worked seven and a half years in the Middle East. I've been in all of the wonderful countries that I would consider to be cat box countries because you don't want to be out there in the desert. <laughs> But from the perspective of you want to import that energy into the U.S. and pay that price, as well as their environmental responsibility is not to the same standards of what we or our Canadian counterparts have done as well. Think about that. Where do you want your dollars to be invested overall? Yeah, in the summary, I think you should get uh, Tony Jack and Kent's uh, number and then actually just bring him in on the telephone call. Just to <laughs> stay here. Uh, yeah, we have one over here at Santa first, so I'll be right back to you. Go ahead. I, I haven't heard much about the Fort Berthold Reservation, which is right in the center. How does that play into uh, or factor into development? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the difficulty, this is, this is kind of a, the um, stink bomb and the punch bowl, uh, because it's run by the federal government. and. Uh, trying to get a permit from the federal government. It takes about 300 days to get a drilling permit from uh, the Department of uh, Interior. It takes about 18 days from the state. And what, you, what most people don't know is that if you are drilling there, or if you're drilling anywhere, and you are going to cross any federal minerals, even though you're not crossing the surface, you still have to get a federal permit. You have to wait the 300 days. So it, it's gotten better because the tribes have gotten with the program and we've got employment programs for uh, members of the tribe. And for, uh, um, but for decades, it's been absolutely awful. Happily, they have some facilities built out in Newtown, which is south of the lake, um, and actually just south of where we operate. So that's helpful. Uh, there's a lot of potential there, but the problem with the federal government is they won't lead, they won't follow, and they won't get out of the way. So you're, you're kind of in a box there. Yeah, and uh, as a former partner in a Native American-owned company, matter of fact, we have three uh, Native American-owned companies in the Bakken Energy uh, Service Group by design. We have one that's a 100% Native American-owned group who is a tribal member on the Fort, uh, on the Fort Berthold. Uh, we have another 100% Native American group that's off, that is not members. And then we have an 8A, it's actually an Alaskan-based company, uh, who, all, who also fortunately has an office right in Washington, D.C. Uh, so uh, we can, we're kind of covering all our bases. Here's, here's my take on, uh, on Fort Berthold and the three uh, affiliated tribes. With Tex Hall as their chairman, uh, who had been chairman before, I believe he's a brilliant man. And uh, he can go to Washington and make some statements that some people can't. Uh, they're also backing it up. I also see that they're actually starting to come together. Uh, the, the biggest problem, uh, which, which Jack had mentioned, is that in North Dakota you're dealing with state. When you are on the tribe, you're dealing with a sovereign nation, which is overseen by the U.S. federal government. And what uh, takes uh, 18 days in a state takes 300. As a matter of fact, uh, as the anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, just happened of uh, how many years, I doubt today if we could have built the Golden Gate Bridge or the Hoover Dam. 
So uh, there's there's some definite slowdown again. It's private enterprise, and when, when these people talk about uh, the hoarding the money, uh, uh, you can see the investment. But the other thing that's very important, it's their money for their shareholders. And uh, they, they take care of it. And again, it's a safety, safety, safety issue. Back over, uh, you had your hand up, please. Uh, Mr. O'Reilly, unfortunately, doesn't listen to most of us. Um, uh, I think what we need to do is get to Charles Krauthammer and have him take that Krauthammer and beat O'Reilly. Go ahead, but uh, it, it's really unfortunate that he does have he does have this blind spot, and it's it's uh, it's very sad because a lot of people listen to him. He's probably the most influential guy that we could have on our side, but he continues to uh, advocate the other side. He needs to go to North can I mention one thing? One thing that the North Dakota Petroleum Council, the governor's office, uh, my business has been involved in in the last 10 years. We've seen on average between four and 7,000 students uh, about energy development and careers in North Dakota over that period of time. You can either have an, uh, uh, an emotional electorate or you can have an educated one. And so 10 years ago, we started with the Petroleum Council trying to educate the people of North Dakota about the process. So we don't listen to Bill Riley an awful lot. I mean, we can see, you know, what has happened is that Ten years ago, the students that were in fifth grade are now voting. And so when you start thinking about, you know, the, and for 30 years from now, we have to continue that public outreach. And so it's, uh, you know, that's part of why North Dakota, I believe, is successful. They, you know, those initiatives were uh, embraced. All right, guys, thank you so much. It's 4.45 almost, so we're a little bit late. But thank you for everybody who attended today. Anyone that has a PowerPoint, you can give me our courage to bring it up front, and we'll get it over here in the next couple of days. Thank you.